Hi everyone, this is Luke, and today I'm going to do a bit of a special third step that's a little bit out of the box considering the type of content that you might usually kind of expect to come out of me. Although I professionally am a game designer, so usually tackle these episodes from that perspective, back in the years before I began to develop games professionally, I spent a lot of time in the indie adventure games community primarily doing pixel art. If I'm being honest, I was much more well known for my animation than pixel art itself, but I always loved working in pixel since it's such a unique art form that makes use of all the traditional skills that you might expect to gain from traditional art, but simultaneously pushes back against art tropes in a very meaningful way. Of course, like most art forms, the limitations imposed are frequently a one's own, so there aren't any real rules per se about what you can and can't do, but if you get deep into the pixel art community at places like Pixelation, Pixel Get-In, or pixel joint, you'll find that many of the artistic challenges that are set forth follow some very specific rules that can both challenge and grow the perspective pixeler artistically in unanticipated ways. So over the course of today's video, while we watch a time lapse of me creating some not all that impressive speed paint style pixel art, I'd like to talk a little bit about some techniques that are employed in pixel art that people might not really recognize or appreciate if they aren't invested in the art form. I know that there are a lot of people out there who switch off the moment they're able to see a pixel on screen and god forbid a handmade sprite be magnified to three times or four times size, but pixel really can be very impressive if you take a moment to appreciate what's being done on the screen. One of the most common themes that you're likely to encounter in the creation of pixel art and nearly any given pixel art challenge is that of the palette. If you aren't familiar with the term in either the context of computer graphics or painting, your palette is the selection of colors that you have available to you. Though in modern computer artwork we have access to more colors than you could possibly name in a human's lifetime, back at the dawn of graphical computer games, artists were restricted to some very tight budgets. CGA Graphics, a primitive graphics processing form, is about as old as I am, and was originally limited to 16 colors. The many memory limitations in computers of the era disallowed the cohabitation of most colors in the same sector of a screen. This essentially meant that pretty, vibrantly colored ASCII art games existed, but most other games were looking like a hot mess of cyan and magenta. It was the EGA and VGA eras that really saw pixel art take off, and generally speaking that's what most people remember of video game art from the 80s and 90s. It's no secret that I'm a huge fan of old fashioned graphic adventure games. As this episode airs, Matt and I are smack dab in the middle of a playthrough of one of Sierra's early classics, the historic Americana adventure Gold Rush, which was a shining example of EGA graphics in their prime, as well as a very cool showcase for one of my favorite tricks of the early era to get a little bit more bang out of your graphical memory buck, the double wide pixel, using half the memory to cover the same amount of screen space, and therefore opening up the screen to a whole lot more color usage than it originally might have had. Even then, however, the average EGA game was still limited to a palette of 16 colors that were generally speaking patently ugly. Not unusable, but needlessly bright usually, and often a little tough to look at unless done stunningly well in the manner that Sierra and LucasArts games tend to be. Now in modern pixel art, though it's significantly less common to see strict adherence to the god-awful palette that we were once forced to work with, the practice of budgeting one's palette still remains a very large part of pixel art. You'll see in the image that I'm working on in the background here that I'm doing the entire image in essentially shades of red, tan, and gray. Thanks to the humanized tendency to blend colors together or contextually perceive colors differently when placed next to one another, you can get away with using a very limited palette and still have your piece of art feel very color rich. True pixel enthusiasts will probably look at my artwork and tut at my wasteful use of probably too many shades of tan, and I agree that honestly I could probably cut at least three or four colors from my palette and still maintain the visual quality of my work, but hey, I'm out of practice. This is legitimately the first piece of pixel art that I've created to completion in probably two or more years at this point. To digress, however, staying under a hard limit of the number of colors that one's allowed to use forces the artist to consider each pixel carefully, as well as the interactions that it will have with the neighboring pixels. To digress, however, staying under the hard limit of the number of colors one is allowed to use forces the artist to consider each pixel carefully, as well as the interactions that that pixel will have with neighboring pixels. I make a lot of use, personally, of a technique that is actually fairly polarizing in the pixel art community. Many purists honestly seem to hate it, though I'm not entirely sold on its evils. It's called selective outlining, entertainingly shortened to sellout. 
a technique that was utilized frequently by companies like Capcom to create more smooth appearing curves on the outlines of characters in games like Street Fighter. I butcher sellout frequently and also adopted a technique personally adapted from it that makes use of the mind's tendency towards accepting optical illusions and drawing lines where there aren't any, perceiving connections where they're only implied. You can see it on Angus's lapel here, for example. Ironically, perhaps, when working in pixel art, most of the advanced techniques that are employed are specifically created to cast the illusion of smoothness and softness on really very harsh squares. Sellout is one, anti-aliasing is another. When I talk about anti-aliasing in this context, of course, you might first assume I'm talking about the graphics processing technique of sampling neighboring colors on the edge of a 3D mesh and blending them in screen space to create a more smooth transition from object to background. But though the end result is similar, this is a much more meticulous and very much human-driven technique. While harshly contrasting colors will create the illusion of hard shadow and sharpness, similar colors placed nearby one another can result in a soft, smooth transition. Not that this should be that much of a surprise. You can create soft, pillowy looking sections of your image by strategically placing a mid-range color on the hard edges between elements of an image. Depending on how limited one's palette is, this can be a luxury that you just don't have, but as I said much earlier on, the limitations are all upon the creator. Anti-aliasing, when done well, can be one of the keys to a really good piece of pixel art in contrast to one that's only mediocre. My own anti-aliasing technique really only falls between passable and the mediocre as well, but I'm at least familiar with the techniques enough that I can show you a little bit in this video. If you want to have your mind blown by the quality of some people's art, the same communities that I listed above and will happily link below are grand places to start looking. Beyond just the use of color, though ultimately at the micro level such as pixel art is, color really is sort of everything. In order to really sell a picture to the viewer, the image is as much subtraction as it is additive. The image that you're watching me chicken scratch together here is on a 150 by 150 pixel canvas, though the finished image will only be about 108 by 120 pixels in size. If I were to be using this for a sprite in a game, I would likely change this to 128 by 128 which is one of those lovely power of two sizes you've no doubt heard of or will be hearing of, and use the remaining wiggle room to allow for animation, which hey I may yet do in a future episode. But on a 128 by 128 canvas, that means that even using the entire vertical canvas, you're limited to about 14 pixels vertically for a human sprite's head, assuming the generally anatomically accurate 9 heads tall human model. And that's actually huge for a human model. The original Street Fighter models, which took up most of the screen space in their games, were originally about 128 by 128. Take the average RPG and your characters are about 32 by 32 pixels typically, maybe 64 if you're lucky. But that's 3 or 4 pixels for an accurately proportioned human. This is why JRPGs usually opted for what they refer to as ni toshin, ni tengo toshin, or san toshin, being 2, 2.5, or 3 head body, respectively. The big head style that you'll probably recognize from a vast majority of the games in the NES and even SNES era. Even if half of the vertical space of the image was then occupied by the head alone, that's still about 5 or 6 pixels for the hair above the forehead, and maybe 10 for the face. That's not a lot of space for a face at all, to be honest. Now these technical limitations ultimately spawn some iconic images that persist even today in games that don't strictly require that sort of proportion. My own art tends to skew more towards the quasi-realistic, but everybody has their own unique style, which is an awesome thing about pixel art. Overpaints of Mega Man or Final Fantasy sprites notwithstanding, there are a lot of very cool styles that can be created even with very little space. Minimalism is in vogue right now, but there are some fantastic games that use pixel art as a medium on the market right now. I'm personally a big fan of Crawl, which we just recently did a short playthrough of, as well as games like Dungeon of the Endless, Orion Trail, Crypt of the Necrodancer, and Kingdom, to name just a few recent titles. Honestly, there are a whole lot more, and way too many for me to name in a short period of time. Each doing some very cool and unique things with their individual pixels. I think there's this really weird stigma that pixel art is always meant to be considered retro or is some kind of shortcut that lazy developers take, but I don't think that either of those statements really hold any kind of water. 
It may be niche if for no other reason than that there are people who will always discount them because everything has to be ultra smooth 3D graphics or meticulously hand drawn 2D graphics. So basically it has to look like old school Disney, new school Disney slash Pixar or Weta style. But every piece of pixel art is the culmination of a lot of mental gymnastics working to very tight restrictions and requires actually a ton of work to create something that actually looks really good. Unlike my kind of sloppy southern rooster gentleman here. But hopefully the next time you get a chance to look at a game that's done in pixel art, I'd like you to take a close look and really kind of consider the choices that were made in the art style. Now before I close up shop for the day, I'd like to make a shout out to an awesome YouTube channel that's already far more popular than our own, but hey, it deserves every iota of visibility it can get. That's the 8-bit guy, previously the iBook guy, who made some awesome technical videos breaking down the mechanics of old school graphics that are totally worth your time to watch. I'm a big fan of his channel, and if you like pixel art like I do, I think you might just end up being one as well, assuming you like technical stuff. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my very good and very accomplished pixel artist friend Shane Stevens, whose work you may recognize from adventure games like the recent Kathy Rain, Wajit Aya's Resonance and the Shiva, and the upcoming Pixel Noir, which I fully intend to play very soon on the channel. He was one of my earliest inspirations to get into pixel art and mentored me, not only in being a better artist, but a better scripter in AGS, and he also put up with my flaky shit when I was bad at committing to projects in university. You're the man, Progs. And that's all for me today. Thanks for bearing with me and watching me pixel. I hope that you enjoyed it and maybe learned a little bit about pixel art in the process. If this kind of video is interesting to you and you'd like to learn more about pixel art, or even just like to see me do some more pixel art in general, or other kinds of game art, you need but ask in the comments section below. But for now, thank you as always for watching, and have a great rest of your day. See you tomorrow. Take care.